I just sat and listened to dying patients and tried to be their spokesman and to teach medical students and theology students and nurses and people in the field of social issues about what people really try to say and if you can only sit and listen and hear what they say, they teach you not only about dying but about living. And to me that's the greatest gift to be able to sit and listen and hear. When Elizabeth Kubler-Ross first listened to her dying patients more than three decades ago, she had no idea she would transform many of our culture's attitudes toward death. With the publication of many controversial books, she has continued to challenge not only the healthcare profession, but the basic values of our society as well. A doctor and trained psychiatrist, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross has spent the last 20 years fighting what she calls the last and greatest taboo of the Western world, our fears of death and dying. With extraordinary sensitivity, she learned to let dying people speak for themselves. At the medical school in Switzerland, we didn't have courses on the care of dying patients or interviewing patients or beyond medical help. But as soon as you graduate in Switzerland, you go and take over a country practice usually. And the first week I had terminal ill patients and I had to sit with them and listen to them. And so I used to make my rounds. I had a whole valley with seven villages and I was the only physician. So you could not just pass the buck. You took care of everybody and everything. And I used to make my rounds and then I would go to see my dying patients at the end of the day. And I had all the time in the world. And they really became my teachers and I loved it. So it, you know, already was the beginning of my interest in caring for dying patients. The oldest of a set of triplets, Elizabeth Kubler was born July 8, 1926, in Zurich, Switzerland, to a middle-class Swiss-German family. Always dressed like her sisters, Elizabeth began as a young child to struggle for her own identity. While training as a lab technician, in 1945 she interrupted her apprenticeship to join in relief work in post-war Europe. There she helped rebuild schools and clinics and discovered people sought her out for comfort and assistance. After working at a small clinic in Poland, Elizabeth visited Maidnik, a nearby concentration camp, to view the aftermath of the tragedy for herself. Returning to Switzerland, she became a doctor in 1957. She married a medical student and joined him in America. Do you understand what dying patients teach you about life and living? Today, in workshops, seminars, and lectures around the world, Dr. Kubler-Ross inspires all who come to listen. She is dedicated not only to helping us face death with dignity, but also to helping us live each stage of life more fully. This Nova takes us on an intimate journey with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross as she shares with us her life's work. They will share with you not only that they know they're dying, they will share with you when they're dying. They will share with you from whom they need help. They will share with you when they need help. And they will share with you what it is specifically that you can do for them so they can die with peace and without fear and without anguish. Everybody knows that there is no such a thing as immortality. But uh, nevertheless, uh, if you get a verdict, it's something quite different. Especially as I was in, uh, I wouldn't say perfect health, but I was normally a healthy person without any big uh, troubles. How long did it take them to make a diagnosis? Uh, I think that at the first visit, he nearly pointed it out that this is something to do with my pancreas. Mm -hmm. And this... Uh, shows you that the end is close. What is the most frightening part of it? 
Captain was frightened by those. Now I have to leave them. Unprepared. Because nobody can prepare himself, nobody can prepare everybody else for this. It was sad. Yes. But after a while, you live with the, with the thought that uh, this is the end, that's all. You lived a nice life. You brought up a family which I'm proud of. Your job is done. Finito. Suddenly people realize that all the things they treasure they can take with them. And they look back at their life and they say, oh God, I made a good living, but I've never really lived. And then all their regrets, all the fears, all the guilt, all the shame comes to the surface. And if you help these people externalize it and let it go, they can literally die with peace and dignity. The sad thing is that people do that at the end of their life that they re-evaluate their values and their variables. So your family is really your main support system and your main strength? Also, not the big strength, the only strength. Yes. This is the only thing which keeps me. Because I will tell you the truth. I thought of suicide. Because you feel the pain and the physical agony? Yes. And uh, I knew that there is no, no way out. I will be a crippled man with the, the pain and uh, nothing to relieve it. And uh, ultimately going to stronger and stronger medicine, which keep me completely disorientated. It is not necessary to turn dying into a nightmare. But, on the other hand, it's a diminishing, diminishes my art of thinking. A, I cannot concentrate. A, I cannot do those things which I was preparing myself to do after my retirement. It is almost an expression of your anger and resentment why this is happening to you now when you finally retire you could do all yes, these maybe, maybe. Look here, that's doctor. how I see it uh, this, this is my problem what to do with this spare time uh, I kept myself looking at the clock which is horrible this is 4.35 this is 4.40 4.50 mm -hmm. this is horrible I have to supply my, my 24 hours a day with some meaningful things. You can only do that when you're able to get rid of your anger and anguish and resentment. Once you empty that pool of all that repressed anger, then you can start living fully. I mean, live fully, not long, but fully. This is what I'm constantly repeating to him, yeah. that as long as I have my power and my energy, I will do everything to help him to live and to be strong. Will I spend the rest of my life looking at the watch? That is what the art of medicine is all about, is to teach people to live until they die and to live fully. I just... I, well, finally, I just says to myself, Scott, you got to get off this um, death thing, you know. You, you've just been going down, down, down. You got to live. You, you, you can't, you know, just make the decision, and like the doctor said, and just, you know, float down and finally die. And did you ever experience any real rage and anger about all this? I, I, I used to mm -hmm. just sit in, in my room, you know, why why me? It was yeah. a question, you know. I, I just just finally said to myself, Scott, you're either going to have to die or, or, or live. 
And I mean, you know, not just in, like I was in bed. In between, yeah. I'm, you're going to have to really live. After that last operation, I, when I finally woke up, I says, no way am I ever going back there again. We have perfected the most sophisticated machines to keep bodies functioning. We never ask the permission of the patient. Is that really what they want? To me, that's a terrible uh, dehumanization of the experience of dying. We have become experts at keeping people alive because our approach to life is so completely materialistic. Fear is the only reason that keeps them cooped up in hospitals. Fear of lawsuits, fear that they haven't done everything, fear what the neighbors would say that they have given up on them. All fear and guilt. So you add another life prolonging procedure, another chemotherapy, another surgery, another machine. To me it's a projection of our own fears and our own inability to let go. Please, doctor, do something else. Perform a miracle. I bring all my dying patients home. It's a very different kind of dying than being in an intensive care unit hooked up on tubes and respirators and monitors and machines, where the relatives can only come in five minutes every hour. To me, the quality of life at the end is incredibly important because the memory for those who are left behind are a great contributing factor how they're going to go through the grief period. And if they know that they have been at home and, and have loved them and have contributed to the happiness of the last few days, they don't have all these guilt and shame and fear and, oh God, if we had only done this or that. If you are raised in medical school, to do exclusively nothing but to cure, to treat, to prolong life. And you get absolutely no help how to be a physician to a patient who is going to die on you. You naturally must feel like a failure. You naturally desperately try to do something else. If they begin to realize that they are not here to prolong life, that we cure practically nobody, but to help them to live as fully as possible, a meaningful life, then they begin to change their whole attitude about what it's like to be a physician. In our society, we all have become great experts how to keep people alive, but we still do not train enough people to take care of the total patient, of their emotional, spiritual, other kind of needs. And that causes the big problem. The future medicine will be very different. It will be truly a holistic kind of medicine where we take care of the physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual quadrant of the human beings. Then we won't have all these problems. Then we also know when to call it quits and not add any more life prolonging procedures. But even when a patient recovers enough to leave the hospital, Dr. Kubler-Ross has observed often there is no place for them to go. We ship all people to nursing homes, so we don't have to look at the wrinkled faces. We don't love wrinkled faces anymore. Our society has created a environment where productivity is God. Uh, when you are no longer young, no longer pretty, no longer productive, what's left is, I call that the garbage pile, the nursing homes, the places where nobody wants you. And that's the tragedy, I think, of our society.
we have become much more mechanized, uh, much more technological, much more materialistic. We spent six billion dollars in the United States alone to erase those gorgeous wrinkles. We have not only taken the dignity out of dying, we have taken the dignity out of living. We have been obsessed in our society with more, more, more. Youth is the ultimate of happiness. You have to be physically fit, you have to look youthful. We spend billions on looking different from what we are. And that is not self-love. All illness or ill health or aging is like it's a disgrace. It doesn't fit into the ultimate dream of what life is supposed to be like. You cover a, a grave site with artificial green grass. You put makeup on a corpse and rouge and lipstick and eye blue and stuff to make them look like they're only asleep. It's all phony. People live this way and they prepare them this way even after death. And that should not surprise us then that dying patients are viewed with a sense of, of horror and dishonesty and total lack of openness. If we could raise another generation without all these artificial fears that we are given as children by the grown-ups, People would never be afraid of death and dying, and they wouldn't be afraid of living. Dr. Kubler-Ross travels continually, spending more time in the air than many airplane pilots. Her message has reached thousands of people, not just in the United States, but in Europe, South America, and Australia. Wherever she goes, she is met by patients, relatives, students, nurses, and social workers. Her work is supported by the proceeds of her best-selling books and lecture tours. So she never has to charge her patients. Well, normally I have to get up at five, fix a cup of coffee, take a plane at seven, usually miss my meals, then I have an evening lecture, and then I see patients till two, three in the morning, and then I sleep a few hours, and then I catch a plane again to the next place. So I can plant as many seeds with my lectures as possible. I eat very little. But you see, I believe that nothing can harm you if you don't let it, so. There are 125,000 courses on death and dying taught in the United States alone every year. Ten years ago, I was totally alone. When I started this work, I was very much hated for sitting with dying patients and making the hospital famous for dying patients. And a decade later, I received so many doctor degrees, I can't even count them. And I don't understand that because I've never invented anything. I've never done anything except sit with people and listen to them and hear them. The most frustrating thing for you right now is that you can't speak well. Bringing the patient home to a familiar and loving environment provides more opportunity to counsel not only the patient, but also the family. Dr. Kubler-Ross believes that giving the final days of a loved one to their family significantly helps relatives cope with their grief. She knows that she's um, going to die, but the process is taking a long time. And what is it that she's supposed to be learning through such a long process? If you can regard this as a challenge and not as a threat or a punishment or something negative, but as a real challenge, like you're able to communicate with her mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. You can learn to communicate like this with your husband and with your children and with me. Mm -hmm. And that's not so difficult. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You know, as long as we don't fake it, that we mm. understand you when we really don't. That is also a lesson for us. And then they have to learn to read your needs and your wants. And then it's their gift to find out what it is that you mm -hmm. want. The one thing Mother wanted to ask you, and the thing that bothers her, is that she feels that she's, since she's unable to use her body, what purpose is she serving? And she feels like for anybody to live, they should have some purpose in life, and she can't see what her purpose is now. Yeah. Do, do you think it's more important to run around the house using the broom and cleaning windows? Mm -hmm. Or is there also a purpose in learning how to receive? Mm. And letting you... You got her there. <laughs> and letting your children mother you a little bit after mm -hmm. you have mothered them for so many years. Don't you think that teaches them something? No. She feels like she's a burden, and when she gets down, she starts talking about maybe she should go into a home, and we have to really talk that out. Every day you can give your children to take care of you and to see your courage and your love is a gift to them. And you cheat them out of all these experiences if you're afraid mm -hmm. to receive. Your wife has had this paralyzing illness and now she can barely speak. What did all this do to you? Well, it was pretty well stunned. And uh, I felt that she, uh, something was taken away from her that she really didn't deserve. Uh, although I know that there's things in life that, you know, there's not really too much you can do about it. You have to take it as it comes. But it's uh, very difficult for myself, especially. I thought I was a pretty strong man. and. Uh, I find that I'm pretty weak that I can't accept the fact that she's uh, kind of bedridden. What does that do to you? Well, it uh, kind of uh, destroyed a, a lot of uh, hope that I always uh, had in, in my mind that, you know, we would continue enjoying a life like this for forever. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, it's a dwindling situation and uh, I'm falling apart with it. What do you mean by falling apart? Well, I uh, just can't seem to reach out to her and, and grab her hand and work with her uh, to do things that we love to do together. Makes you feel very impotent. Very, that's right. Yeah. The message I get from you in between the lines is that you're helpless and impotent and cannot contribute much anymore and everybody else is busy around your wife yeah. and sacrificing and giving and that leaves you sitting out in nowhere like not wanted or not needed. Well, that's just about the way I feel uh, right now. I can go in there and sit down next to her, and there's not much I can do for her. Uh, I wish I could make her smile more and make her happy. I've even lost the art of doing that. Depression has creeped into me uh, quite heavily, and I'm sorry to say that I'm, I always thought I was a strong enough person, but I evidently am not. I've become pretty weakened because of this situation. And I, now's the, the time for me to become very strong. You can do a lot of things for her. You can be her hands. Yeah, you can but... read for her. She can't even turn the pages anymore. No, you she can can't. do all these things for her. People usually wait until somebody's dead or is dying before they review their relationship with them. You don't really say, 
the things you would say today if you would know that this is the last time you see them. I don't know if you're aware of that poem of the young woman who wrote to Vietnam to a boyfriend. Do you remember when I spilled blueberry pie over your brand new car rug? I thought you were going to kill me, but you didn't. Do you remember when I tried to make you jealous and I mean that with your best boyfriend and I thought you certainly leave me, but you didn't. Do you remember when I insisted we go to the dance and you wanted to stay home? I did talk you into it and I forgot to tell you that it was formal and you showed up in blue jeans. I thought you were going to kill me, but you didn't. And it goes on and on and then the last line is, I wanted to tell you all this when you came back from Vietnam, but you didn't. That's unfinished business. For parents of terminally ill children, unfinished business is sometimes overwhelming. Most parents make it difficult for children to die because it is dreadfully, dreadfully difficult for them. And it is very hard for a parent, for any natural, normal parent, to face the reality of the death of a child. Okay. How long has your brother been sick, Deborah? Since we've um, lived in a house. Mm -hmm. Has that been a very long time? How did it all start? Um, cause, um, he had a brain tumor. Uh -huh. And then he was operated on? Oh, is she? Yeah, and then he had to have radiation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got it out? Yeah. Okay. You want me to put him on? Oh, yeah, put his arm up. Well, he could knock everybody down. Okay. You want to put this guy on? Yeah. Yeah, you put him on. Who's that? The sudden illness of a young child forces parents to re-examine their own lives. He started complaining about drastic headaches and that he was sometimes falling down. About a week after that, he lost his vision overnight. Just one night. Totally blind. Totally blind. And yeah. he, he was blind and stayed blind since? He stayed blind Robot. since, yeah. Robot. Mama? Right. Okay. So we went to um, the hospital in Santa Rosa and they did a, a brain scan on him and found a five centimeter tumor lodged in the uh, cerebellum region of the brain and uh, we went into absolute shock and panic that night. I think probably the most profound change that I've undergone. I came out of a background of being Western and rational. Uh, I used to be a physicist. Things were certain. Um, they were orderly, proceeded along that way. People had to be orderly. Lives were orderly. And... Uh, Predictable. Yeah, past and present and future. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really been not just altered for me, it's been totally removed. And I'm, st I'm still not back from that yet. It's like after living a life of such absolute need for certainty, what I find now is that I'm living in a flux of uncertainty and learning to be comfortable with feelings that go along with that, that I never gave myself permission to. Can I take, a, take off a coat? Sure. <laughs> Once parents face the possibility of losing a child, they never look at life the same way again. But it takes Dr. Kubler-Ross much longer to help adults than children. So then I got um, my tumor, you know, and then they removed that, and I guess that's when they found out it was cancer. I started going to the university hospital for a while. You know, my dad told me on the way home from the hospital, he said, I don't want you to be scared because a lot of people think it's real bad and you always die from it, but you don't. 
and he told me that the that it was cancer. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really that scared because I had gotten used to it. Show me how you can relax. First, you close your eyes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you imagine ten steps in front of you. Mm -hmm. And you slowly walk down these steps, relaxing twice as much as before each step down you take. Then when you get to the bottom, you see a door, and you open the door and see a long hallway with lights, all different colored lights on top of it, and each with a little label next to it, and each with a string hanging down to um, turn the light off. Then you walk down this hallway, and each label is labeled a part of your body, and each light represents a part of your body. You find, say, like you're going to get a needle in your left hand, you find um, the label that says left hand, and you can imagine the light any color you want. And you imagine yourself turning that light off. And when you turn that light off, your body will be, your left hand will become numb. And you just have to imagine, you have to concentrate on turning that light off. Dr. Kubler-Ross believes these counseling sessions enable children to share their unfinished business and face their illness honestly. Uh, how did it start? At the hospital, they gave it. They told us that I have cancer. They don't know what kind. They just I, told you like that. Well, yeah, and they told me I had a tumor in my chest too. And they showed us exactly where the tumor was, mm -hmm. how big it was. Mm -hmm. and told me, like, they didn't know what it was, but they, I had to have an operation. So then after they said that I had to ha have an operation, and then me and my mom finally found out that we got this deadly disease, and I had a deadly disease. And what, what was your reaction to all of that? Mostly it was like a victim number. I felt like the whole world was coming on in me, like, it, like why God scoot everybody away from me and get me to give cancer. Mm -hmm. And so then I had to finally realize that I had a killer disease. It's either you kill it or it kills you. Yeah, mm -hmm. do or die, Dad calls it. Children are much, much easier to work with. The younger they are, the easier they are because they have not been contaminated with all the negative conditioning and the ugly basic attitudes. Like, I'm only lovable if I'm a good girl, things like that. Young children are not afraid to die. They can talk about it very easy and very comfortable. They told me that I had a disease and it was called... Well, I knew what cancer was, and, and they said I had cancer. And I didn't feel really that much bad, because I never knew what it did that bad. Mm -hmm. Where did they tell it to you? Uh-huh. After I did a couple of um, treatments and I saw how bad it could get, I felt real surely that I was going to die. What does death mean to you, Keith? Like death? What does death mm -hmm. mean to me? Well, it just feels to me like going out of one stage into another better stage. Mm -hmm. And, well, I, I knew if I would die, I'd go up to heaven, but, but I was thinking to myself, I'd miss my mom, miss my dad, miss all my friends, my brother. Do you still feel that way? No, not that much. Mm -hmm. I feel bad yes. sometimes because I can't play football. Yes. That's my favorite sport. I used to play that all the time. Yeah. Did you learn anything out of this experience, out of having cancer? Learn anything out of it? Mm-hmm. Well, one thing I learned is I could go through life, that life is pretty tough. What was your reaction when you heard that your brother had cancer or might be dying? I just thought, you know, once you get cancer, you're, you're dead. You know, yeah. There's no hope for you. Yeah. Then my mom told me that, you know, there are some things that help you for cancer. Some treatments. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. See, I thought Keith was smoking because <laughs> I thought the only way you could get cancer was by smoking, and I thought Keith Now, who was... gave you that idea? Well, I used to watch it on television. Smoking causes cancer. That's why mm -hmm. your lung association mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Were you ever jealous of your brother for being special? Well, of course, because, you know, they get the shots and treatments, and mm -hmm. I know the shots are painful. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so. so when you're angry and you feel it's unfair, what do you do with it? I don't know. I just keep it bottled up. Well, then it's not going to go away. Mm. Well, I'll go in my room and, mm. you know, I just don't talk to people. Keith was diagnosed oh. in April of 78, in April of 1978, with Ewing sarcoma, which yeah. was a bone cancer. Yeah. Were you honest? With your child at the beginning, did you tell him what was wrong with him? I told Peggy, and uh, I said, let's let's tell him. We should tell him. Peggy agreed, and, and uh, so we told him. And, and right away, he says, he got upset. And he said, oh, you know, cancer, you know, you die from uh -huh. cancer. And I said, well, that's true. I said, but wait a minute. And I said, there are thousands of people that have cancer, you know, that uh -huh. are still living. That's right. And uh, they're they're doing great, you know. And I said, and that's what how we're going to deal with this. So we're going to we're going to fight this thing. We're going to beat it. And Wonderful. He, just and like a game, just like a football included. game. Oh, oh he yes. was right there. Uh -huh. right. Yeah. So the four of you did uh -huh. that together. Right. Yes. Fabulous. Right. You have to be so fair between the boys at all times. Once in a while, Kurt, the sibling. Why does Keith get everything? Why does, you know, well, because, you know, he's sick. Do you want his sickness? You know, <laughs> no. And, uh, you know, when you explain it to him like that, uh, you know. How did you cope with the diagnosis at the beginning? How did I cope with mm -hmm. it? <laughs> I don't know. I think, uh, and it was really funny, you know, like it, uh, geez, I have all these things to do. For what? You know, I didn't know. And, uh. And I, I just that kept was saying, your way of coping with the show. That must have been. Yeah. I don't know. You know uh, but you shared uh, everything. Yeah. You do something with your head. Yeah. You say, well, you're going to just put all this bad stuff aside and just work with the good. I think we all play act for the doctors. We don't want them to really know. We want them to feel that we are keeping together and we are perfect. And we really aren't. You call that strong. And it's not natural. That's right. The natural thing would be to cry. And That's to share, right. And to share your tears and say, God, it's difficult. We hoped it wouldn't be true. And to cry together and not have to play a game. Dr. Kubler-Ross uses the interpretation of spontaneous drawings to help patients and relatives reveal their true feelings. She gives them five minutes to draw anything they like using colored crayons. <laughs> She then interprets the drawings based on the choice of colors and the selection and placement of objects on the page. They share with you their unfinished business, their awareness of their own impending death, their concept of death, and whatever it is that you can help them with. And in 10 minutes you can find out who is suicidal, who is falling apart, who is on the verge of a breakdown, and who is really in a good place and has internal strength to cope with it with very little external help. <laughs> <laughs> she openly analyzes each picture with each person. What is special about the picture is that there's a lot of black in it, which means that you still have a lot of grief about the whole thing. See, when you start out, you have a big, strong, tough man with muscles and, you know, super strong. And then it gets smaller and smaller without the body. I guess that's when your brother's body began to be affected. And then you have another one without the body and the legs are separate. But behind all of this is a big, strong, powerful guy who is more strong than this one except he has no feet yet, the feet are... Well, I, I had no room. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, that's the excuse. But you still think that his body is getting stronger, but he's not standing yet on solid feet, mm -hmm. meaning his cancer is not quite gone yet, and that gives you a lot of grief. 
And then he moved to a guy who was a black face and a wooden leg. Has your legs been affected most? Well, one of them. Well, my left leg, one time, um, I couldn't walk on it, and I had cancer in that leg, but after I had a little radiation in it, it felt better, and I never had trouble with it again. Uh -huh, but it affected your brother a lot. Are you somebody who likes to run around and use your feet a lot? I like to, but, you know, I have asthma. Uh -huh. Well, not that bad, but I have it. Uh -huh. and because that's one part of you that you still have to deal with, of what it means when you can't run around anymore. Do you have any questions you want to ask me? No. Anything? No, not really. No. All children know that it is revealed in their picture. Mm -hmm. It is not an intellectual knowledge. It comes from their intuitive spiritual quadrant. And this is why it's only revealed in pictures. And if you understand the symbolic language, you can talk with these children about it and see if they have unfinished business or grief or something that they need to do to be at peace. And they're so uncomplicated and beautiful and honest and open and so delighted if a grown-up knows where they're at and doesn't add fear and guilt, but helps them to understand and get rid of it. His future picture it's an existence in another world, but it's in gold. It's a golden space city, mm. which is, he said, more beautiful than this one. Of the mm. two. This is the most important, that he knows that he can always be in touch with planet Earth and the people on planet okay. Earth. And he said this is the commuter plane between this existence and the existence on Earth. You have a picture yes. like this, it's beautiful. Uh, you need, uh, he needs no help right now. I mean, he's in a good place. He knows exactly where he's at, he has no real fears. He's, uh, he's, his life is tough. It is more tough than beautiful right now because he's struggling and fighting mm -hmm. for it. And as long as he can externalize that without Oh, come on now, it's beautiful. And, you know, trying to make mm -hmm. it sound more beautiful than it is for him. He's in a good place. That's terrific when children can be that. Kurt. Yes, the older boy. You well, child. Okay. Yes. yes. Has his biggest problem, his unfinished business, and that's something you can really help him with, has fantastic amount of grief inside. Grief, repressed grief leads to asthma. And he says he has asthma. You help him to cry, <coughs> to be, feel like a big man, because grief is a natural emotion. And if he can really cry and, and express his grief in a safe place, you know, with one person that he's comfortable with, he, his asthma will get better. And he will get, everything is in black. Black is a color of grief. And he even tells you what he grieves about. In the past, big, strong, husky guy. Then turns into a guy that One has leg. a wooden leg. His future image is that the same guy that used to be strong, then got the wooden leg, will replace the wooden leg. It will not become good, strong legs ever again but he will get wings to fly, which is very beautiful. But the grief, you have to help him with his grief. Mm. Yeah. You have to give him some special space where he knows that he's special in his own way, that you don't need counsel to be special. And if you have tears, share it with your older boy, alone. Go fishing with him or, or take him someplace where the two of you can be alone and share with him some of your grief, and then he can share his grief. See, we are created to fulfill our destiny in one lifetime, and when one begins to get bad, the other ones compensate. And that's why young children, four or five-year-olds who are dying, are really wise old souls. I can communicate with them on a level that I could never communicate with a healthy four or five-year-old. Yes. And they know it's an inner 
kind of knowledge. And this language of the drawings mm -hmm. communicates with that inner knowledge. Elizabeth found the hills of Southern California most reminiscent of her beloved Swiss countryside and chose Escondido for her home. Although she has almost no private life left now, what she does have is lived here. This is where her children Kenneth and Barbara come to visit during college vacations. And this is where she can find a brief respite from her hectic schedule. It's a paradise here. And it's totally quiet. You know, it's like living at the end of the world on top of a mountain. A little bit uh, like Switzerland, except Switzerland has a totally different climate. She insists on answering all her letters herself. There is a backlog of thousands piled up in boxes, labeled super urgent, very urgent, urgent, and not so urgent. My dear Linda, thank you for your letter and for sharing your feelings with me about the anniversary of the death of our little Jamie. I was so thrilled to see you again, although it was a brief moment and in a big crowd of people. I will always remember this special day. As a doctor, she is always on call, counseling the dying and their relatives. She frequently works day and night, often till two or three in the morning, answering and making phone calls. Dr. Kubler-Ross has come to believe that the dehumanization of death and dying in the 20th century has grown out of a belief system in Western culture that pervades our attitudes toward life. In the West, we raise our children in a very peculiar, unnatural way. We teach them literally to suppress all their natural emotions. The values are very peculiar. You know, you academic standards, you have to be pretty, you have to be healthy, you have to be rich, you have to have a great education. Uh, internal values are never even mentioned. And when it comes to dying, all the negative conditioning will be remobilized. And we end up making an incredible tragedy out of it. Instead of being able to look at life as a challenge, we look at it as a threat instead of at the end of life celebrating all the things that we have been able to share and to give and to receive, we mourn the loss and we drown ourselves in self-pity. And all great moments we in a way turn into tragedies. Hospitals and institutions are terribly impersonal and it's not the place for a child if you can avoid it. The very least we can do for our children when they're dying is to bring them home into their own familiar environment with their toys, their pets, their families, their own thing and their own bed, naturally. Mm. I had a nine-year-old boy who had leukemia for six years and during his last hospitalization, he was very much at the end of his life. A young physician recommended another experimental chemotherapy. And I asked the parents if they had asked this little boy for his opinion about it. And they loved him enough to really consider his opinion and he said, no, thank you. So we took him home and he asked for me to come along with him and I told him I had very little time, I can't go home with all my children. He said, don't worry, it only takes 10 minutes. And as we drove into the garage, there were uh, two hooks with a brand new, unused bicycle hanging there. The biggest dream of his life had always been to ride around the block. Once in his lifetime, he never made it. So he asked his father to take the bicycle down with tears in his eyes and in the father's eyes too. He asked for the father to put the training wheels on. Then he looked at me with this marvelous smirk and he said, and you're here to hold my mom back. Because mom wanted to pick him up and lift him up and hold him and run around the block. And she would have cheated him out of his greatest victory in life. When he came back, he was beaming like he won a gold medal. 
And then he said, very matter of fact, we take the training wheels off and bring it to my room. And he looked at me and said, you can go home now. That was the last time I saw him. Two weeks later, his first grade brother had a birthday. And he told us that his brother gave him the bicycle as a gift to him. Told him that he would not be around anymore on his birthday. He wanted the pleasure of giving it to him. And he said, you can have it under one condition that you never use those damn training wheels. And to me, it's a marvelous example of parents who love a child unconditionally and can listen. They have the memory of this triumphant ride around the block instead of adding another treatment and he would be nauseated and sick and he would be in intensive care unit. And the memory would be very painful and now they have a very happy memory of having made it possible for their little boy to have his great victory. Everyone freeze. We're going to the bottom of the ocean and we're going to feel this water all around our bodies. If we would raise the next generation of children with unconditional love and firm, consistent discipline, not punishment, but discipline is a learning experience and would really understand what unconditional love is, those children would never be afraid of life nor of death and we would never have to make films and write books about that sometime. Most of us were raised, I love you if. I love you if, if, if. I love you if you bring good grades home. I would love you if you make it through high school. Boy, would I love you if you go through college. Oh, would I love you if I could say my son the doctor. And we raise a generation of prostitutes. They prostitute themselves with good grades, with achievements, with honors, with degrees, and they literally end up believing that you can buy love with good behavior or rewards or whatever. And then they marry somebody who says, I love you if you buy me a mink coat. Next year it will be a sable coat. When you wake up the lessons Dr. Kubler-Ross began learning many years ago today form the foundation of a philosophy for living. She believes that healthy children like these can be spared the fears most adults have experienced if they're given a chance to be brought up in an atmosphere of unconditional love. But the people most likely to turn to the work of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross are not just the future generation, but the elderly of today. If we could combine our nursing homes with the daycare center for toddlers of working parents, toddlers would grow up again loving old wrinkled faces and the old people would be loved and hugged and could spoil somebody and could tell them stories about good old England or wherever they grew up. And they would feel wanted and needed. And the next generation would have far less problems than we have now. Shelly, yes. can I put my picture on here? <laughs> Aging, for people like these, can be a fulfilling and rewarding experience when embraced without fear. To further her dreams, Dr. Kubler-Ross has created a non-profit foundation called Shanti Nilaya, a Sanskrit word which means home of peace. Especially in our city. You want to put your feet down, don't move you with. Fight to the end. From that center in California, she coordinates an international network of people who participate in her various seminars, lectures, and workshops. The man is coming. Oh, how do you know? Her ambition at each session is to create an atmosphere of unconditional love and sharing, which can help participants live their lives, however long, to the fullest. How's she doing? You begin to see when you talk to 20,000, not only dying adults, but children, that love is really the only essential thing in life. Not the kind of love we were raised with, I love you, if you bring good grades home, I love you if you make it through high school, that kind of, of, that's not love. But unconditional love is the only thing that helps you not only not to be afraid of living, but of dying. <laughs>